<laughs> look at this. Look, man, look, the look, legend. At, look at this guy. Dude, have you been only doing lower body? What's the deal? Lower body, calves, shins. <laughs> <laughs> Keep walking. What? I want you to walk that way. So today, on the record by Big Nick, I got a special guest. He pitches for the San Francisco Giants. He's a Massachusetts native. Shout out to Auburn, Mass. And uh, he's been uh, nice enough to join us today. So he's a great guy. I'm seeing him in a couple weeks. I can't wait to give him a big ass bear hug when I see him. His name is Tyler Beatty. So. <laughs> I love it. Thanks so. for having me on, brother. Yeah, no, I, I'll accept that bear hug, except those biceps may crush me by the time I get in those arms. Woo! I'll, those be, I'll be careful. I'll be careful. It's been a while since we've seen you. So. I know. I miss you guys. I'm excited to be up there. Yeah, me too. Um, so I guess the biggest thing that we're going to talk about, I guess I'll start with this first, is obviously you're recovering from Tommy John right now. Um, so I guess we'll just talk about, you know, how that, how, how's that going, you know, um, how's that, that process been like for you? Obviously you got the surgery and you've got to rehab it. And, um, I guess just talk to us a little bit about, you know, the process when you first got it, when you first found out you had to get it, um, and obviously how you're doing now. Yeah. So. Um, I think the, the thing that I always look back on in those initial moments of finding out that I was hurt and needed Tommy John, you know, I, I was actually pretty pissed. Like I gave myself 24 to 48 hours to be, to be upset, to be pissed off because man, I was just coming off of a four or five month grind of an off season where I, you know, busted my ass and was working hard and trying to be, you know, in the best shape and, um, feel you know confident mechanically and on the mound to where I could compete and make that team and make the rotation and so going into camp I made you know uh, two starts and felt great man my stuff was good I felt consistent and then just had the injury pop up and um, and so it was discouraging right but then after about 48 hours I you know I needed to get into a positive mindset and know that I you know this this surgery was going to be a positive for me it was going to allow me to have 12 months to really work on my mind, body, uh, my soul, and really work on some things. And so I, I you know, went into surgery March 20th with a positive mindset. Um, Dr. Meister did a great job. And, um, and then from there, it was a grind, man. The first few months were actually pretty terrible because they took a, they took a ligament from my, my hamstring, my left hamstring. So essentially, you know, I went, to, went into it thinking, yeah, my right arm was going to be I wasn't going to be able to use my right arm, but then I couldn't use my left leg either. So I was hobbling around. Wife was doing a lot of taking care of me, things that she probably never expected to have to do, marrying me uh, this soon at least. And uh, and then just grind, man. So where I'm at now, you're kind of catching me on a positive upswing of I get to, I get to play catch for the first time next week. I've been doing weighted ball stuff. So it's been a grind, but, man, I'm, I'm certainly encouraged by the results so far. So – um, that sounds great so far. So would you say that this Tommy John surgery that you had would be one of the biggest things that you've had to overcome in your life so far, either baseball, professionally, when you were younger, in life in general? Would you, would you say that that's one of the most biggest things you've had to overcome so far? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, for sure. I, you know, this is my first big injury. Um, first time I've really missed baseball for this long of a time ever. You know, I've, I've never had a summer off from baseball since I was about maybe 10, 11, 12 years old, right? Where I've gotten to be home and have no baseball activities and no um, need for me to be at the field. So I think that hurdle is difficult because, you know, part of my, my passion for the game is obviously competing on the mound, but it's like being around teammates, helping people, uh, being, uh, being a fun guy. I like to put smiles on people's faces, kind of enjoy that part of the game off the field in the dugout in the locker room. So I'm certainly missing that aspect of it. And, and this being the year that it is, I can't be a part of that because of COVID and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, this, you know, being top of the list as well as some hurdles just um, mentally throughout my career of, of, of my identity being wrapped up in the game. Um, you know, I can certainly go into great detail with that, but I would just say, uh, in my career, uh, I've learned to 
disassociate Tyler B. Beatty being identified as just a baseball player um, and really, you know, caring more for uh, things off the field and, and not being associated with just being a baseball player. So uh, in regards to hurdles uh, physically, this is definitely one of the biggest ones, but mentally, you know, I feel much more mature and able to handle this kind of rehab. If this, you know, if, and if this happened a few years ago, I may have been more of uh, not a wreck, but I may have struggled with it a little bit more. So you say that if you were to have this injury a few years back, you would have been more of like a wreck and maybe you wouldn't have taken it as well. Am I correct? Is that kind of how yeah. you're going with that? Can you kind of just elaborate on that as far as obviously you say a couple of years ago, because obviously a couple of years ago, you weren't as wise as you are now as a baseball player, as a person, more importantly, just things that you've had to do in just life in general. I mean, so what do you think you've learned over the last few years in your young life that not only baseball wise, but just, you know, obviously you're married and, you know, yeah. you, kind of, you know, juggle things. And I know you got some family up here still and so on and so forth. Like, yeah. what do you think you've learned over the last few years in your life so far? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that, look, baseball matters to me, but it's not everything. Um, you know, I used to, growing up, even through college and early few years in pro ball, you know, pro, baseball was everything to me. Whether I had a good game or a bad game, my attitude and my mindset would fluctuate depending on the results. I was so outcome oriented. If I had, you know, a great game, I was a great guy to be around. I was a better husband or a better fiance, whatever it was at the time. If I had a terrible game, I was down in the dumps. I inter internalized a lot of my, my struggles, my anxieties, my fears, my doubts, my struggles. And so it would kind of bottle up. And then, you know, over the course of the season, you do it that long and it's going to, you know, come out in forms of depression or anger. Um, I wasn't an angry person, but I certainly was a guy who would internalize emotions to be um, a, just a little bit um, – detached from reality of what was going on and so uh, I said to say like where I'm at now man like I need to be completely content with if this you know I'm going to bust my ass in the weight room and rehab and throwing to be back to who I was before but I need to be completely comfortable and content that I may not be the Tyler BD I was before getting hurt or I may not be a guy who's capable of pitching in the big leagues that's not to say I have a negative mindset like I'm completely uh, positive and, and, and locked in to, to be in the best that I can be throughout this rehab process. But it's to say, look, baseball, I may not make it back. Like I may not be completely healthy. There may be, uh, you know, hurdles that I need to overcome. I may have setbacks, things like that, to where I'm not worried about it. Like I can only control the things that I can control and in regards to the things that I can't. That's where my faith comes in. I just trust God that he's going to provide for me along the way and that everything that I'm going through is an opportunity for me to learn and grow. So uh, I just try to enjoy it, man. Like enjoy each part of the process and not worry about the results of the surgery, the results of the, the rehab, the results of throwing week to week. Like everything will take care of itself as long as I just continue to trust and do what I can within my control. That sounds great. Um, I guess the other question I have for you, not to keep harping on the uh, Tommy John thing, but just the, uh, my last two questions that I have for you about this is I meant to ask you a little bit earlier. When did it happen? Like, was it when you were on the mound, when you were just playing catch? Was it, did it happen in the weight room and you just felt something weird pop when you were in the weight room? Like, how did it, how did you know, like, oh shit, like something's up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was gradual for me. So um, I really felt it after throwing. Um, it was, I threw like I had my first start uh, and it felt great, man, through two innings. Um, felt money and then that week trying to bounce back like as I was trying to throw my bullpen in between starts just didn't feel right um, and then as the week as I got closer to making my next start I, did, I could just tell something was wrong I never really felt that discomfort for that consistent of a time um, and I tried to get it resolved I thought it was just some spring training soreness but I went to, to pitch that second start or second appearance and man uh, I just felt like there was someone jabbing me with a knife in my elbow. So I, I had to tell the trainers and then we got the MRI and went through the protocol of getting multiple opinions and seeing what was the best decision to make. And um, yeah, I just really had the gut feeling that Tommy John was needed at that point. Yeah. 
So obviously now you're you, you were saying that next week you'll start throwing catch. Now what is how, how does that process work? They telling you you have to throw like 60 feet. Obviously everything's going to be flat ground. Obviously so. What is it going to be? You gradually get to maybe 90. Like, how does that work? Like, what's that next? What are the next few weeks for you look like as far as throwing again? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's super light stuff. So the first day next Monday, it's going to be like 10 throws at 30 feet, 15 throws at 45 feet, right? So it's not a lot. Okay. It's super light. Um, and then just gradually building from there. I mean, over the course of that first week, I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple sets of that um integrating some weighted ball throws uh before and after so i think with the elbow like i'm completely confident that it's healthy right now just from doing my plyos weighted ball stuff lately it feels strong it feels healthy it's just a matter of gradually building up reps and stressing the elbow just enough to where you know you allow it to recover you allow it to get strong and then you can just build on top of that foundation as you know is it strong right now okay yeah, well, like I said, Ty, I mean, you're not only you a great baseball player, but way more importantly, you know, I can't stress this enough either. You're just a great young man, and you just, you know, you, you're classy about everything you've done. Obviously, you've had a lot of hype, obviously, when you were younger, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, you know, obviously going through high school and stuff, and everybody's like, oh, that's Ty, oh, that's Ty. But, like, you never, like, were, like, that type that was, like, yeah, I mean, I'm tired. Like my shit don't stink. Like you just, you just were like everybody else. Like you just had that mindset. Like you know, I'm part of the team. I'm not the team. Yeah. You know, it didn't matter like how many you know scouts came to the game and how much hype was around. Like, because I remember when I was in high school and stuff, everyone would be like, "Oh, you know this Tyler Beatty kid?" And I'm like, "Yeah, he works out with my brother at Cressy's, whatever." You know, blah blah blah. Like I, I did. That was the first time I heard about you. But like, everything that I heard was like, okay. He might be this big time stud out of mass, but like the thing that I heard about, especially from AJ, is like, he's a great human. Like to mm -hmm. me, like that's way more impressive to me because obviously I grew up with values that like the person's first, then either the baseball player or the painter or whatever your profession is in life. Yeah. You know, like we are all humans at the end of the day. Like, no doubt. You know, I hope that you play baseball for the next 20 years and you come back from this and you're stronger than ever and stuff like that. But obviously there will be a time that yeah. obviously you'll have to put the ball down. If it's next year, five years from now, you don't know, nobody yeah. knows. But at some point you'll have to put the ball down. Obviously everybody's dream growing up is like, oh, I want to be in the coach. I want to be the next Ted Williams or the next Nolan Ryan or whoever. But like whoever your idol was when you were growing up, we all had that idol when we were growing up. But it's like at some point, like it's like, okay, maybe I'll get through high school for some of these kids. Maybe I'll go through college. Maybe I'll, you know, play minor league ball some and then just know that, you know what, that's it. Like, you know, I had my time. I enjoyed the game. I love the game. But obviously something else is going to take over. So if you thought about, quote, unquote, and again, I hope this doesn't happen for many, many years from now because I still got to go to San Francisco. You got to tell me BP like we talked about. It. It's <laughs> thing when you get healthy. So, but have you thought about what your next, like, is there things that you're working on now to prepare yourself for when baseball's over? You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, what, like, have you thought about, okay, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe I want to get into – you know, I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe you want to, you know, be a designer. You want to do this. Or like, is it? What's that thing that you're like working on right now, that you're thinking about? Okay, you know, if this doesn't work out, you know, I've got this, or I've got this plan. I want to do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah, it's a good question. First and foremost, I appreciate your words. Um, it means a lot hearing that from you. The Newkowski family in total is just an incredible family. One of America's top families in my book. So. I appreciate you saying that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think lately, I, I mean, I'm so passionate about helping kids through the baseball process. My dad and I are both passionate about it. It's something that we've tried to team up together lately, especially now that I have more time. And just communicating with parents and kids coming through the recruiting process for college or, or, or summer youth camps and showcases, um, even when they're younger than that, figuring out you know, when is it right to shut down from throwing? How long should you throw? Should you try to specialize? Uh, you know, we always encourage playing as many sports as possible. So in regards to what line of, you know, business or what I would 
be passionate about doing. It's just that. It's like, man, I, I, I think kids nowadays, they don't have their parents and kids. They don't have the proper resources and guidance to figure out how to navigate the baseball process from as young as 13 to as, you know, to up to 18, 19, even into college, you know, like if you need to transfer things in that context. And so, man, um, I just feel like I've been blessed to have gone through as many opportunities as possible going through the draft twice, dealing with college recruiting process, dealing with travel ball showcases, camps, um, pitching coaches locally, um, and just all that stuff that I feel like I have so much uh, knowledge and, and understanding that I just want to pass it on and in an organic uh, way um, just from what I've learned and from what my dad and I know we just love to pass that information on so um, I've enjoyed also being you know a part of Lumberland where I feel as if I have a purpose um, and able to contribute to a company that's having a lot of success and to do it in a in a way that from a distance you know I would like to be if once I'm done baseball a little bit more in person where I could have you know, potential leadership role. I love being around people, man. Like I said, I love inspiring other people, encouraging other people, building other people up and bringing the best out of people. Um, so really any position that involves that and entails that is something that really, you know, stirs my affections for life and, and really gets me out of debt in the morning. So uh, that's a long-winded answer, but that's really what I'm passionate about. <laughs> so um, you mentioned about getting drafted twice. Um, just help me on this real quick because I'm not 100% sure. Obviously, when you were at Lawrence Academy, you graduated when you were 18 or 19? 18, oh, yeah. 18? Just okay. 18. Um, you were drafted in the first round by the Blue Jays. What, what pick was that, um, the Blue Jays? 21st pick. 21st? Yep. 21st. So you were drafted 21st. Um, as eight at, at 18 years old, and you decided to go to Vanderbilt and go play for Corbin. Um, so my question to me that I had to you is, it's a two-part question. Part one was, what was like the ultimate factor in you deciding, you know what, no thanks to the Blue Jays, I'm going to go to Vandy. And then part two, how was it playing for Corbin? Like, was he, you know, the hard ass that everyone talks about? Was he, like, more like, you know, he had that face when people saw him, but in the back, behind the scenes, he was, like, a more, like, you know, I don't want to say laid back kind of guy, but, like, he was, I don't want to call him softer, but, like, you know what I'm trying to say? He was more like a, I'm fine, I'm having a hard time with the wording, but it's, like, he was more like a people's person, I guess. So, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he was more like a player's coach. That's probably a better way of putting, like, a player's coach. So, yeah. I don't know if you can just uh, elaborate on both of those questions for me. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that decision, I try not to mull over it as if it was an easy decision because I'm not insensitive to the fact that the money that was offered to me was life-changing money, especially for the Beatty family. I mean, we weren't well off, um, and, and that money would have gone a long way and would have changed our lives. So, um and I felt even at the time, you know, mentally mature and polished mechanically and from a baseball standpoint and ready for minor league baseball. You know, I just felt as if I had, you know, a good foundation, um, a good support system to sustain myself through minor league baseball. But um, at that age, it's, it's, it's easy to get, you know, blinded by the amount of money that you're being offered and the dream of coming true of playing pro ball. I mean, it wasn't going to be the wrong decision, but the right decision was for me to take a step back and see the all-encompassing opportunity of Vanderbilt, right? Obviously, you talked about Corbin. He did a great job of pitching me um, on the aspects of how I would benefit and develop from a baseball standpoint. Obviously, at the time, Derek Johnson was there, who's the pitching coach of the Reds now. Um, and obviously David Price, Sonny Gray, all those guys were coming through and having a lot of success and getting better and putting themselves in position to be drafted again in the first round. So I was confident that all that was going to be uh, good and well on the baseball side. And then he brought up academically, right, how prestigious of an education you can get from Vanderbilt. And obviously being able to, you know, go to a university of that uh, pedigree and playing in the SEC is incredible. Being able to get a degree from Vanderbilt I mean, you can't put a dollar amount on that in regards to the, the value of that education. 
And then you think about being a kid for from the ages of 18, 21, 22 years old in Nashville, Tennessee, being able to experience the South, Nashville, country music, man. Um, it's just, it was incredible. Um, and he did a good, a good, good job of presenting it as an all encompassing opportunity that, you know, would be hard for me to turn down. Um, and then looking back at it, like being there and, and you're answering your question about Corbs, like that was probably like out of those three that I mentioned, like the thing that went unnoticed was how he's able to develop your character, your leadership qualities, being a good teammate, being a better son, a potential, uh, a future husband, a future dad. Like he just cared so much about you as a human being that it wasn't even about baseball majority of the time. He just, and like you said, he was, a, he was, he was a disciplinary, right? He, he made sure that you weren't slacking off. He didn't want you to be content and comfortable being this Vanderbilt, you know, student athlete, you know, things should be good for you. Like he wanted you to continue to get better and desire to get better. And he made sure if you were slacking off uh, or being content or comfortable, like he would light a fire on your ass. And I always appreciated that about him. Maybe in the time I didn't, but um, looking back at it, uh, he was great at what he did. And he did have a, a good um, job of, of being a player coach and then being a disciplinary guy who was like, especially now, like, I mean, I don't ever see that side of him where it's, you know, he's not lighting fire in your mass anymore, but he's, uh, he's fun to be around. And he had that, he had that um, ability to switch on and off when he was going to be a, you know, a fun guy to be around and sometimes when he wasn't. Um, but man, I learned a lot. I grew so much there, you know, mentally, uh, maturity, um, and just uh, was super thankful for that aspect aspect of it, obviously, in addition to the education and the athletics. So you were at Vanderbilt for three years, correct? You yep. were there for three years? Three seasons. Yep. And in the three years that you were at Vanderbilt, you won one national championship, correct? Or two? Yeah, the last year, 2014. I got to ask you, because I've been telling Casey all day, I'm like, I've got to ask him this question, just because to me, like, when you win something like that, like, that's just, that's some big time shit. How was it when, like, that last pitch was thrown and, like, you sat there and you were like, we're the national champions. We're the NCAA <laughs> national championship. We, we were the last, we're the last team standing in Omaha. And, yeah, I mean, how, how did that feel? Because to me, like, I, I couldn't even imagine how that feels. I mean, I get excited when I win 14-year-old things and I'm on the sidelines as a coach helping my dad. Like, I couldn't even imagine being a player, like, you know, so if you can, if you can just walk us through like how that game went, because that must have been an exciting game, obviously too. Oh, but um, yeah. how'd that feel? Oh yeah, I mean, I always find it difficult to find the words to describe that um, experience because it was, man, it was an up and down, it was a roller coaster ride. It was a long uh, trip to Omaha, 15 days, and you know we dominated. We had a couple scary games. We had to fight back. Um, but man, when yeah, when you have that moment of just euphoria, you get to celebrate. You know that you won. You get to you get to run around and hug your teammates. You get to jump up and down. You get to hold the national championship trophy. I was fortunate enough to go running over to Corbs because he didn't want to come out there and dogpile and celebrate with us. Um, man, it's just like it's just an emotional time because you go through that whole season, and the season doesn't start in February. It starts the fall before when you all come back to campus in September and you grind and you go through the Omaha challenge, you're busting your butt in the fall and you're, you're trying to come together as a team to figure out your identity. You're having the ups and downs of the regular season. Um, you're building chemistry, you're building trust. And then you get to that point in the postseason where we were coming off a, diff a disappointing SEC tournament. We went 0-2. Corbs rode home on the bus in his uniform still. We got up to the classroom. He's got a fungo in, in his hand. He's uh, basically just banging his bat against the whiteboard, pointing us all out and, and, you know, making sure that we had a fire lit under our ass going into the postseason where we met as a team after that, just the players. And we said, look, like, we're going to come together. We're going we're gonna to trust in each other. We're going to pick each other up. If, if one of us has a bad start, the next guy will pick each other up. If, one of us strikes out, the next guy will pick each other up. If we lose, we'll come back and we'll win the next day. We just had to trust in each other. And we went out there and balled, man. We played well. Obviously, you know, we had Walker Walker Bueller, Carson Fulmer, Dansby Swanson, Brian Reynolds. 
Xander Wheel, John Norwood, then like the team was absolutely loaded, right? And so we just had to put it together. And we had a special run. And then you get the dog pile at the end. Rav closes it out. Another mass guy, Rav and Nell. And so, man, absolutely incredible. And it's, I mean, sometimes the moment still hasn't sunk in. You look back at it, watch the highlights, and it's like, you have to pinch yourself that you were able to, to accomplish the first national championship at Vanderbilt. So, super cool. You were also talking about earlier as to what you're thinking about outside of baseball, what you would want to get involved in more. You were talking about with your dad, like you'd want to give back to kids who are, you know, you were there, you were 14, 15, and you went through the process of, you know, either going to a showcase or doing this and trying to advise kids like what, you know, to do and stuff like that and give back to the kids, give back to the game. So I guess the biggest thing I'd want to ask you is there's a lot of people that I've run into. Um, there's a lot of people that I call him the goat of coaching my dad that he runs into as far as like, you know, kids, like they try to rush it. Like they're like, Oh, you know, I want to light up the radar gun. So a big time school can see me or, you know, sort of like they just, they don't understand like it's a process. Like you got, you know, you got to the off season, you got to work when no one's looking. Like you can't, you can't be only working when like someone's there. Like you can go to Georgia, you can go to Tennessee and light it up, but it's like, they're going to ask you questions. Like they're not just going to take it based off, okay, can you throw X on the mound? Can you hit it 400 feet? You know what I mean? Like, like what would be your biggest thing? Cause I, you know, you said you wanted to give back. Would that be something you'd be, like, interested in, like, helping kids, like, that are going through the process as far as, like, hey, you know, just take it slow. Like, what would be your best advice for anybody who's watching this that's, like, you know, 15, 16, and, you know, he's going through the process, you know, and he's got a lot of talent, and he's trying to figure out where he wants to go. But obviously, you know, try to humble yourself, too, if that makes sense. Because there's a lot of kids that will be like, hey, yeah, you know, Vanny's looking at me or Florida's looking at me or, you know, like, your shit don't say It's like, bro, I don't care. Like, you're throwing a baseball. Like, you know better than anybody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we run into that a lot. Like, I know a lot of kids that are, like, they're arrogant. It's like, oh, yeah, I can do this. I can do that. It's like, buddy, <laughs> go across the country. Like, there's more of them of you out there. You know, you ain't the only one. You know, you might be the only one in the area, but <laughs> it's a very small area. You got to open it up. And I don't know. Like, I – I just – I always try to figure out what to say to them, but I also, like – I try to balance it because, like, if I'm coaching them, like, I don't want to be, like, their dad and, like, sit there and go, hey, you know, turn it down a notch. But, like, if you're on the field and I can see that arrogantness, it's like, well, bro, like, uh-uh. Like, that, that's not happening. So what would your biggest advice be for anybody who watches this that, you know, is going through the process? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's so many ways to go about that. Um I think about, you know, the game will humble you so quickly if you have that attitude of like, I got the game figured out or, you know, I'm on top of the game right now. And I think there's a time and place for confidence, especially when you step between the lines. Like you better think that you are one of the best players on the field. But when it comes to how you handle, you know, the day in, day out grind and being around your teammates and like you said, working behind closed doors, like, you better, you know, get after it as if, you know, you need to get better every single day um, and do it in a humble, humble way where, you know, like you, like you talked about, man, this game can be taken away from you so quickly. So enjoy it while you're playing. But um, like this game is all about relationships and being a good teammate. Like, you know, if you, if you at the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to name players, um, you know, in the big leagues who I've come across you know, who are really talented, but you just don't want to hang out with them off the field because they, they just don't know how to be a good teammate or they don't know how to, you know, have a quality relationship and conversation with you. So um, I just, you know, I tell guys all the time, like, you need to be able to figure out who you are and build a strong foundation around that. So, like, if you're trying to be the best 16-year-old pitcher on the planet and then that's it, like, you kind of, you go out and you do the velocity programs and the weighted balls and, you know, you just try to go light up a radar gun and say, you know, I was the hardest thrown 16 year old this summer, but I, I had a nine year array and I walked a guy in inning and, uh, you know, hit six guys. And, uh, but I was throwing 95. It's like, man, you need to kind of check yourself and see what's important. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of ways I can go about attacking that. But I tell guys, man, like poison composure, man, like you need to be 
able to be flatline and understand the moment and when to be confident and when to be humble. Um, and above all else, being a good teammate. So, um, you know, I think uh, the biggest thing is setting yourself up for a foundation in regards to maybe it's crisis sports performance where it's like you take a summer off, like, dude, maybe you, yeah, you got some velocity right now, but maybe go work on some command and some mechanical inefficiencies that you need to, to fix. It's like, maybe take this summer off. I know it's, I know all your buddies are going out in Georgia to play and, you know, you're going to be a part of a showcase and it's going to be, there's going to be scouts, but you know what, in the long run, maybe it's best for you to take this summer, go to Cressy's for two months, get stronger, work on some things mechanically that now by the time you're 17, 18 and you're getting ready to go into college or even when you're in college, like you have this foundation of like, man, I'm so thankful that I went to Cressy for those two months, three months and really built myself a solid foundation where I put my ego aside. I felt like I didn't need to go move up the rankings of perfect game. Um, and I, I humbled myself. I didn't play because I know that this work that I put in now, it's going to pay dividends in the long run. Like, man, I wish so badly that I could tell kids that it's so hard because you're so blinded by, I want to move up the rankings or I'm in, if I move down then my friends are going to look at me like, um, I'm not good anymore. It's like, none of that, none of that matters. Nobody's opinion matters as long as you're doing what you need to do to set yourself up for success in the future. And that doesn't have to be in baseball. It's just like the people that I've met at Cressy, like if I had met your brother at Cressy, he wouldn't have taken me to church for the first time in my life, really in a consistent basis. I wouldn't have had deep conversations with your brother for things that I was struggling with as a kid and, you know, certain relationships. And, and because my identity was tied up in baseball, like I think about the value of Eric Cressy in that environment so much more than just from athletic development, like personal development, friendships. Uh, I couldn't be more thankful that I've run into the Nukowski family all because of Cressy sports performance. And so it's not to say that I don't find that there's an importance in going to perfect game showcases or camps, but man, you need to know when it's time to, to work on things other than just building velocity and trying to move up a rankings list. Right. So uh, I could go on a tangent all day on that, but overall, that's what I would recommend. Uh, I, I, like I said, I appreciate because obviously you've run through a lot of people, you know, and for us, for you to think the way you do of us, that's very humbling. So I want to first say that. So I appreciate that a lot. No doubt. Um, I guess uh, the last baseball question I would want to ask you, and I want to just get you a couple, a couple of uh, just off the field stuff real quick. Um, yep. If there was one thing that you could do differently, like it could be anything, like. You know, either maybe there was one year that you pitched too much, you think, or, you know, like you said, like, you know, take a summer off and kind of work on stuff. Like, what would you do differently? Like, I know that's kind of a hard thing, like, to narrow it down to one, but I guess just, like, name one thing that, like, hey, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have played in this league and thrown this many pitches and played here, and maybe I should have took a step back and maybe worked on things. Like you were saying, like, is there anything that you can think of like, hey, wow, like maybe I could have done that differently. Now, I'm not a big like regret guy because like we all live and learn through our mistakes. Like it's not like, you know, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. I mean, is, we're all humans, like you said, like, but, you know, is there anything that you would want to take back? Be like, you know, maybe I could have done this better knowing what you know now. Yeah, you know, I look at, you know, there's obviously things I could point to in high school in regards to what you're talking about of like not overthrowing or trying to throw for the local team and then go play for the travel team and throw. Those are obvious ones for me, but in college, man, I tried to be for whatever reason, someone I wasn't, I always tried to pitch like someone else mechanically. Um, I just felt like I needed to be someone I wasn't in college from the moment I stepped on campus, you know, in the fall, I struggled um, trying to live up to like be this first rounder coming into campus, trying to pitch well and just didn't pitch well. I wasn't used to pitching in fall ball, got my butt kicked in. And then from that, you know, point on, like that rest of the freshman season, I just like tried to pitch like someone I wasn't. Um, and then like continued to get away from that. Even though I had a lot of success my sophomore year, I just, I couldn't go back and tell you like how I pitched or, or what my mentality was or like how I was attacking hitters or what was working for me. Cause I just, I look at how I pitch now, and that's Tyler Beatty and what, how, what I was doing before. I was trying to be someone I wasn't. So, man, uh, it's not to say, like you said, like I don't 
I don't regret the things that happened because man, it all, it all, you know, had an impact on me and it all allowed me to mature and grow and understand how I needed to be more like myself. Um, but it really, you know, made me wander from who I was and, uh, you know, took me down a trail where I, you know, you almost, you, you forget how, you know, what you were doing in high school and forget how you were pitching and what your mentality is. And then you're all of a sudden you, you, when you, when you decide to pivot and turn back to who you are, you have to rebuild the foundation because it wasn't sturdy in the first place from, from college. So it took me some years to figure out who I was and to be confident in my abilities again. Um, so I would just say that's not, that's what I tell kids all the time. It's like, you know, if I'm going to give you advice, filter it in regards to who you are. Like, and if I'm going to tell you how to, you know, peel paint off a barrel, like, you know, maybe utilize like one of the things I, I advise you to do, but don't change up your whole, um, you know, uh, method of peeling paint from a barrel or, or carving mugs. Like, no, like how you do it is how you do it. How, how you pitch is how you pitch. How you work out is how you work out. But maybe you can implement some of the aspects that I've done into your routine and into your game. And so I would say I was always pretty um, easily influenced in regards to changing up my whole routine or my mechanics if someone told me or advised me to do that. So I always tell kids to be on guard about that. So I guess the last couple of questions I just want to ask you quick. Again, I appreciate all your time and everything like that. Um, what are you most proud of right now, Tyler, as far as in your life so far? Like, what is like that, you know, some things that you're proud of? And I'm not even talking about baseball now. I'm talking about like just in life in general. Like, what are things that like you're proud of? Like, to me, like, I'm proud of being a great brother, a great son. Like, like there's like things that like I would say to myself that like baseball is not even close to that category like to me like there's more things that are important than like we've been talking about than obviously baseball and to me like anytime I hear you like Tyler B like okay yeah you're a baseball player okay yeah I got that but like to me like it's like I said earlier in this like I think of you as Tyler B you know what I mean like a lot of people would go out and go oh you know Tyler the baseball player it's like yeah I mean I know Tyler yeah I know Tyler like yeah he's a good baseball player but like he is a human, you know what I mean? Like, I what are the things that like you're proud of so far and things maybe you'd want to accomplish in your life that you still haven't been able to do yet? Yeah, that's a good question, man. I mean, I don't, I don't often think of, of what I'm, I'm proud of in regards to, you know, maybe accomplishments or where I'm at. I just, I don't know why I never take that, that second to, to step back and recognize that. But I mean, just from hearing your, your compliments um, and the words you say, I mean, I guess I'm, I am happy with the way that, you know, I've continued to be the kid that my parents raised me to be. Um, I just, yeah, like I don't feel this overwhelming desire to be, you know, cocky, arrogant, uh, overconfident, uh, egotistical kid. I just, you know, I know what I've accomplished has been a blessing. It's been a gift from God. I, the platform that I have, it's, it's, you know, I just try to utilize it to give back and to help people out and to absorb information and try to pass it on to the next generation of kids. I try to, you know, utilize, um, you know, time that I have with people into a, into a positive way and to build people up. So I'm proud of that. The fact that I'm just conscious of trying to um, uh, build relationships and, um, and help people out. Try to, I mean, I, yeah, I strive to be a better son, uh, strive to be a better brother, obviously strive to be a better husband every day. Uh, so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm proud of those efforts. Um, but man, like I said, my accomplishments, they're just, they're all a blessing. I just am super thankful for what I've been able to accomplish. And more than that, man, I'm super thankful for what I've been able to fail through and in, in my adversities and my struggles and my injury. Um, the difficult seasons of my life, they've been nothing but vital in producing growth, um, dependence on God, like dependence on my support system. Uh, it, it's, it's revealed who has been in my corner through the ups and downs. Uh, I'm so thankful that I've had difficult times where people have, you know, come out and supported me and I've gotten to see who my true friends are. Um, those people are invaluable in my life. So I'm proud that I've been able to build an inner circle of people that I can lean on when things aren't going great, who can light a fire under my ass when I need it, who can tell me to, 
you know, uh, change certain uh, habits that I have or be a, you know, a better friend or be a better husband, things of that nature, man. You need those people in your life. So I'm proud that I've been able to surround myself with, with great people. Um, and I'm super thankful for all those people. So what do you do on a day-to-day basis besides obviously recover, you know, go to PT yeah. and stuff like that and stuff like that? Like, what do you, what does Tyler do for fun? Like off the field, like I know that you're a big fishing guy. <laughs> I, I've I've seen I saw I saw I saw that big fish you caught one time. Uh, Casey showed it to me and stuff like that. And um, but uh, like, what what do you like to do for fun? You know, obviously than baseball. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a family guy. I like to be around family. Uh, we're playing, got into pickleball lately. It's like one of the fastest growing sports in America. We got a court right by our house, so I like to go out and play pickleball, golf a little bit when I'm healthy. Uh, yeah, I dabble. <laughs> I dabble in the fishing. I'm not a fisherman yet, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've gotten some fun out of that. Um, but yeah, man, I, you know, I'm not uh, too um, too crazy in regards to going out and hunting or anything like that. I like to be around the house, man. I like to help out with the wife uh, around the house. Um, not really a stay at home uh, house husband kind of guy, but uh, I like to get out and have fun and um, enjoy the neighborhood, enjoy the town, enjoy the country club over here. Um, and yeah, that's, that's me. I'm not, I'm not too fun, I guess, but <laughs> it, it, I get by. Yeah, whatever works for you. That's, that's, that's how I always thought of it. Cause that's, yeah, man, whatever works for you. That's because at the end of the day, as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. You know, exactly. like, people can say what they want. Oh, you're this, you're that, but it's like, if you're happy inside, like that's all that matters, you know, hundred percent, man. but I love it. So, I've got to ask you now, okay? I've got, I've got to, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask you this real quick. So I've got a fan of mine, okay, on TikTok. And I know him really well, okay? I haven't met him yet, but I know him through friends and stuff like that, and kids I've coached and stuff like that. And his name is Anthony. And he absolutely loves you. I, it's funny. I told him, he goes, do you know Tyler B? Like he just asked, he just asked me, and because uh, he, I talked to him on the phone the other day, and uh, he's like, I'm a huge fan of yours. I want to meet you someday. He lives in, he lives in Auburn. Oh no way! He lives in Auburn, and his favorite player is you, and that's no joke. His favorite player is you because you're from the same town as he's from, and yeah. he star you make it all the way to the show. And he absolutely loves it. He's like, I love Tyler. He goes, I, everything you want to know about Tyler, I know about Tyler. I'm like, you probably got more things you know about Tyler the way you're signed than I do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but he's like, is there any possible way that he can give me a shout out or sign me a ball that has my name? He goes, it would make my absolute life, he said to me. <laughs> and I said, I'll ask him and see what he can do. But I'm sure the type of person he is, I'm sure he wouldn't have a problem doing something like that. But I will, I will send him my – I don't know if this is a, like a one out of one, but it's a, our players, players edition mug that y'all made me last, uh, last year. I'll sign this for him, and I'll, I'll either bring it back to Auburn with me or I'll mail it to him. But, no, I, hey, man, I, what's his name? It's Anthony. Anthony. Anthony, I appreciate your support, man. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud that I grew up in Auburn, and uh, I'm appreciative of your support. So, hopefully to meet you one day, but I'll send you this – Limited edition Tyler Beatty slash Young Beatty mug, and it's all yours. And maybe a maybe a card, maybe a card or two. I appreciate that. Uh, he just asked me. And I go, I'll ask him for you. He's 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 a great. He's a very humble guy. Like he's like, I don't want to be like that. I'm like, he's fine. He 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 wouldn't mind that at all. He's a Anytime. humble kind of guy. So Anytime. I love Anytime. it. I, I appreciate you doing that. I had to, I had to throw that one in there. I'm like, I'm going to just throw it right at him. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, again, Tyler, I know I'm going to see you in a few weeks. Um, obviously at the wedding, we'll have a great time and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. um, like I said, I can't stress this enough to you. Like I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and, you know, talk about a lot of different topics. You know, I feel like we've hit, you know, adversity stuff, baseball stuff, but I really, really wanted to make sure that like 
people who watch this like know like Tyler is more than a pitcher. Tyler's more than a guy who puts on baseball pants and puts on a jersey and goes out and throws every five days. Yeah. Tyler is a Tyler's a human and he's not only a human, but he's one of the best. So for the amount of stuff that you've had to go through in your life, ups and downs, you know, you've always been the same as far as your character, if not, you know, working on yourself in a in a better way. Like you've always been like that. And, you know, my brother obviously speaks extremely highly of you. Um, and obviously my entire family thinks very highly of you. And, you know, I've always told Asia, I'm like, I wish, you know, I wish Tyler lived in mass, like, so that we could like do more cookouts and do yes. more, you know, stuff like that. And just do stuff like just, you know, fun stuff, you know? So yeah. I'm really looking forward to you coming up to spend some time, but there is one thing I'm going to say. Okay. There's one thing. If you come up to Mass and you don't check out this gym that we got down here, I will find you and I will drag your ass down <laughs> again. That's a promise, all right? I will drag you with these things. <laughs> I will drag you like this. You know that fish? You love fishing hook? I'm going to fish you in. I'm going to hook you in right now, okay? So if you don't think that I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, Tyler, you might be here for a week. You might be here for three days. I don't give a shit. You got to get your ass down here now. You got to check out. Because the one thing that I've always said is like, you know, all respect for Cressy. All respect. Y'all don't do enough biceps. <laughs> okay. You guys, you, you guys got your little squats and your little lunges. But like, let's be honest here, all right? The girls check out the arms, okay? I mean, you go down on the beach, you know. I want when I put on that suit with you that day when our AJ's way, like you just want everything to pop right out. So, you know, I'm not gonna I don't want you to get hurt in this gym, but you damn sure better do something in this gym that's gonna make Big Nick proud. You gotta do something. You got because I'll tell you something. We have got we have got so much shit downstairs. I'm like a kid in a candy store. There's oh. I've got bicep machines, tricep machines, we got it all. So you definitely got to make sure you come down to Lumberland headquarters and obviously check out the headquarters again. But obviously, you got to check out the weight room. Again. Oh, there's man. a lot of different stuff in there since the last time you've been. Oh, I, that's like a that's like a guarantee. I'm gonna be there and in that weight room getting a, getting a pump in. Like I don't plan on doing any lower body when I'm in that gym. Damn uh, straight, you ain't doing probably, no lower body. Probably no lower body. Probably <laughs> only left-handed biceps and triceps like all day i just, respect i respect that like i said i do not want to hurt the elbow because i do want you to get on that rubber again and throw it <laughs> but i'm just saying that you gotta make you gotta make big nick proud you got you gotta make big nick proud that's, that's all i'm my, saying that's the only goal in life is to make I'm, big Nick proud i'm just saying i mean i don't follow cressy's way okay <laughs> i follow big nick's way okay thousand arms tons of reps just keep it pumping. That's all it is. And I, you know, some too, I'm, I'm no pitching coach and I'm no strength coach. But I'll say this to you because, you know, I'm going to keep it straight with you. You know, you, you know, a couple more of these, just saying, come back and boom. <laughs> I'm just saying. And then afterwards, you can just go, ha! You go, after you straight that guy, ha! That's all. I'm just saying. That's, I, I, again, I'm not advising that. I'm no pitching coach, and I'm no analytics guy or anything like that, and I got respect for the Giants and everybody you got to listen to and stuff, but when you're in Westford, when you're in Mass, oh, it's on. We got to do oh, it all. Man. Let's go. I'm fired up. Oh, you have to. I'm fired oh. up. You also, said, uh, you also said real quick that at some point you'd want to move back up here. Did I hear that right? Like at some point maybe, or you, 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 you got your ties in uh, Texas down there. I got my ties in Texas, but no, I'm, I'm never opposed to being home for a longer period of time. Um, I don't know if I'd ever move back there, but I may try I don't to blame me. I wouldn't want to move here either. I may try to convince <laughs> Lumberland to open up a secondary facility headquarters in Texas that we could, uh, that we could run down here, but that's just, you know, we're talking out loud. Who knows? Hey, Hey, you know what? I'm gonna tell you something. If you if that happens, if I'm up here for some reason still, I'll definitely make sure I get down there. But if I get down there, I better get the VIP treatment from you and you only. 
Oh, VIP treatment for you for day. I'll roll out the red carpet. I will put away all leg machines and just take out all the no heavy legs. Machines. All right. You can tell Eric Cressy again. All respect and love for Eric. Put those leg machines away. That ain't that ain't what we're talking about right now. We're talking about back, chest, shoulders, <laughs> and biceps and triceps all day long. I love all it. Day. But like I, I said, Talon, and all a serious note. Really appreciate the time, and I hope we can do this again in the near future. And obviously, more importantly, I just can't wait to just see you and just be able to shoot the shit with you and just, you know, have a good time. And, you know, like I said, you're very close to AJ, but to me, like, you know, I, I never worked out with you in the baseball way and stuff at Crescent and stuff like that. But to me, just like you being around AJ and you coming in, just your presence, like to me, like, that's the kind of presence I'd want to be around. And, it, it, and I don't care. And don't take this the wrong way. And I know you won't. Like, I don't care. Oh, he plays for the Giants. Like, okay, that's great. Like, but it's who you are. Like, that's what I care about. No. Like, I don't, I'm not saying I don't care about that. I'm not, it's not what I mean. I'm saying that, like, I care about you as, like, you know what? Tyler Beatty's walking in. Not a San Francisco guy. In the you know what I mean? Like, to me, like, that, that means more than anything. And, you know, like I said, I've had a lot of fun doing this with you. And like I said, I can't promise that I don't crack your back when I, when I hug you. I can't promise that. But I will be very protective of your right side. Perfect. That's all I I'm have. aiming for the left. <laughs> I'm aiming for the left. I won't put you down like Lawrence Taylor, but I will give you a bear hug. And you're going to uh, feel it. I can't wait for it, bro. Can't I mean, wait. It's been too long. I mean, you have to, you have to get it in. And then I might get that little whisper in the ear after the after the wedding. Jim, Jim, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, then, and then the other thing, too, and this is the other thing, Casey, we got to make sure that he does, too, is he's got to be in our show in the pit when he's in here. He's got to be in the pit. That would be honored. Be I'd be honored. I'd pay big money to be in the pit. Did you hear – Tyler, did you hear what he just said? Do you hear what he just said? He just said – would my man Tyler Beatty wake up that early enough to be on the show? Are you kidding me right now? Guess what he said. He goes, do you think Ty would wake up early enough to be on the show? I go, hey, I'm, I told I'm there, him, bro. I'm sleeping in the headquarters that night then. I mean, I, Tyler Beatty will run through a wall after I'm done with him, okay? He's going to have so much energy, he's going to run through a wall. He does office games with us. Oh, he would – he's – I mean, when he's here, he's doing it all. He's doing office games. Peeling mugs. Oh, I mean, he's. I'm he, peeling he, mugs. I need. Right? I need. I need some mug peeling in my he life. He needs the mug peeling, right? Yeah. He needs to get an in the pit. He's got to get on some TikToks with us. Oh, he's oh, yeah. Get on some TikToks with me. You, you 100% got to get this in, Tyler. I'm okay? coming. Boston accent coming out strong when I come up here. Yeah, it's gonna you know, be wicked. Gonna work on that. Because you you sound more like a Texan or whatever you guys get called down there than a Bostonian, but. That's okay. I get it. I get it. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> when do you actually come up? September 25th. Oh, that's close. Wow. All right. We'll be in the, pit. We'll be in the pit in a few weeks. I can't wait. Awesome. That's great. But, yeah, like I said, if you can uh, definitely get on some of those shows with us yeah. um, besides this one, that'd be fantastic. That'd that's be awesome, cool. man. I love it. And thank you for having me on, brother. I look forward to the bear hug in a few weeks. Oh, you know it's coming. Can. Just be prepared. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. I'm prepared. I'm getting prepared. You better. I love it. All right, Big Jay. Get a little bit more working. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tell the boys I say hello. I will, Tyler. Again, very, very much appreciate you taking the time to do this. You got it, brother. I love you, man. Love the boys. I'll see you guys soon. Love you too, Tyler. All right, we'll see you soon. That's it for On the Record. Again, I want to thank Tyler again for taking his time to talk with me. And we, I think we talked about a lot of different stuff. I mean, I could have talked to him for hours, but um, you know, he's a great, he's a great man. And um, you know, I can't wait to see him in a few weeks for my brother's wedding. Um, like, subscribe, put your, notifications, put your notifications in. And if there's anybody else, we got a lot of guests lined up, throw in there who you want to be a guest. Cause maybe, just maybe, I'll talk to you. Wow. Virtually, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, guys.